hotel It's gonna be a great Noel It's the Advent Calendar House Muffins, black and smurfs And even Garfield's Halloween We're gonna take a trip down memory Welcome to the Advent Calendar House, the best Christmas podcast ever, according to my parents and no one else. (laughs) Today's subject is a beloved classic to people who know it, but I get surprised every year by the amount of people who have never heard of it. So let's get y'all educated by taking an only slightly sacrilegious trip back to 1983 to bear witness to the best Christmas pageant ever. I am Tiny Angel wearing a heavenly robe covered in balloons, Mike Westfall. And joining me from a mysteriously smoke-filled ladies' room in the back of church, it's Scott Leopold from Holly Jolly X Masu. Hey, Scott. Hey, Mike. How's it going? Doing well. Thank you so much for being here. And from out of nowhere in the black of night, from festive foreign film fans, please welcome Bob Baker. Hi, Bob. Hey, Mike. Thank you for being here. This is a rare instance for me where I actually read a book of something before I saw it on TV or a movie. I did the same, and I I love the book. See, I, I had a teacher who read it to us. Same. She she was fantastic. She read us the Chronicles of Narnia, and oh, then wow. uh, the uh, she she read us the best Christmas pageant ever. I think she read it to us a couple times. Okay. Yeah, our teacher read this to us in class, and then I went on to read it by myself, and then she showed us this special, and it has stuck with me ever since. I wonder why. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Bob, what's your history with this? I'm probably going to be a little bit ornery tonight, because on the way into the Advent Calendar house, I don't know if your gutter's leaking or what, but there was a mess out front, and I slipped, and I twisted my ankle, and... I don't know. You might be hearing from my lawyers there, Mike. <laughs> Listen, there was a sign. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I my history with this is I read the book, loved the book, read the uh, the sequel or or I, I guess adjacent best Halloween pageant ever. Read that, yes, which was not not the same, not as good, but it was still good. Then I watched this movie and. Uh, uh, there are parts of it that are okay. There are parts of it I feel like they totally missed the mark of the of the book. Okay. Interestingly, it was written by the same author. So I know. Yeah. That's the funny part. <laughs> <laughs> this began as a children's novel by Barbara Robinson, published in 1971. Interestingly, it's known under a different title in the UK, Australia, and New Zealand. It's called The Worst Kids in the World. Oh, not sure why the change. It's not like they don't do nativity plays in those places. Yeah, that, that it doesn't have the same impact. No. And maybe they wouldn't understand if they saw this show why they repeat twice in the dialogue. This is the best Christmas pageant <laughs> <Yeah>. ever. <laughs> they make it a point to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Just in case we miss that. Right. <laughs> Uh, But then Barbara Robinson adapted it first into a stage play in 1982. I actually just saw a local performance of that last week that a friend of mine was in. Yeah, she she played Grace. How was the play? What did you think of the play? Was the play good? Play was good. It's kind of in the middle of what we saw on TV and what you read in the book, because you have you have Beth as the narrator still, but she has kind of a bigger job to set things up. Then she needed to when you have TV to do a lot of the heavy lifting. Yeah. But see, now that's funny about Beth narrating. Like, I, I didn't like that. I didn't like her l- looking into the into the camera and breaking the fourth <laughs> wall. I just <laughs> we'll, we'll get to her in a bit because there are other reasons why people don't like her looking straight in the camera. But let's not get ahead of ourselves yet. But then Barbara Robinson wrote the teleplay for this very special, which is why it's actually one of the most book accurate things I think I've ever seen. 
you know, what I find interesting, and maybe it's the subtleties of the book, mm-hmm. like it's for some reason the book itself had more impact than maybe seeing it on the screen. And that rarely happens, but once in a while, you know, I I think there have been adaptions that are better than the books, but most of the time the books are better. Yeah. But this version of the best Christmas pageant ever we're talking about tonight first aired December 5th, 1983. That was a Monday night on ABC, which means That's Incredible would not be seen that evening. (laughs) There were some angry people. (laughs) I'm sure there were. (laughs) See, I know know we watched this. I don't recall being angry that I wasn't getting to see Byron Allen that night. (laughs) But... But if you want to watch this yourself, it is out there. I found, I think, multiple copies on YouTube and the Internet Archive, so it's not hard to find. I have to I own a copy, if you can believe that. I can believe it. Yeah. (laughs) But let's get into it. We open a week before Thanksgiving as whatever town this is supposed to be starts decorating the streets for Christmas. It's filmed in Vancouver over the summer, so no sign of snow. (laughs) But it's definitely decorated for Christmas as best as it could be for this special. Now, is it is it just me? But when it opens up, does it totally look like a 1980 sitcom? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the music does a lot of a lot of heavy lifting on that part of it to kind of put it in a time and place. I think we then we pan over Urkel or something in <laughs> <laughs> a little too early for that. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, when I was rewatching it the other day, I was thinking it, it, I had to wonder if they had any knowledge of a Christmas story being made about the same time. Oh, there, I there's... didn't even think of that. But yeah, wow, I didn't yeah. Either. I mean, there there are there. There's just parts. I mean, some of the musical cues and some of the uh, just some of the overall look of it. Um, it, it just it, it has a lot of the same feeling, and it, and it could just be because you know it, it was the '80s and a lot of stuff kind of looked the same, but. Um, yeah, I, I just I got a real strong uh, Christmas story vibe the last time I watched it. Yeah, I'm going to have to watch them back to back now. But yeah, that's going to be interesting, especially since a Christmas story has that layer of nostalgia where it's trying to look like the 40s. Mm-hmm. So that'll be interesting. But but we dip into a Sunday school class at church taught by Mrs. Armstrong, who's played by Janet Wright. One more thankful thought. Charlie, what do you like best about Sunday school, Charlie? There aren't any Herbmans here. The internet tells me after this, she was best known from a Canadian sitcom called Corner Gas as the main character's mother. I don't really know a lot about that show, but... Though she did look familiar to me, I think I've seen her in other things. Yeah, she was she was a character actor, so a lot of her IMDb filmography showed like... A part here, one episode of this, one episode of that. But but this corner gas one was one where she was in the whole series. So it's coming up on Thanksgiving and Mrs. Armstrong is asking the kids in her class what they're thankful for, what they like best about Sunday school. And these kids are kiss ups <laughs> and and professional actors. It would <laughs> also true, but I'd say I've never seen browner noses. But we're about to meet a bunch of kids with explicitly dirty faces. So, just I'm thankful for coloring pictures and acting out Bible things, and and the teachers relishing in this. <laughs> what I like best is the good feeling I get in Sunday school. <sighs> And then there is Charlie Bradley, who says he's thankful there aren't any Herdmans here. What's so funny about that is when he says it, she turns and goes to right. Like, and she doesn't even react right away. It's almost like she didn't. <laughs> she was contemplating. Wait, yeah, she thinks about it for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie is played by David Alexander. This is his only credit on IMDb. And that's going to be the case for a lot of the child actors in this. There are a few notable exceptions, especially Charlie's sister, Beth, who acts as our narrator, as we mentioned. It is tiny baby Feruza Balk. The Herdens are the worst kids in the whole history of the world. They lie and steal and smoke cigars, even the girls, and talk dirty and hit little kids and cuss their teachers and take the name of the Lord in vain. 
<laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> this is her very first on-screen appearance, but what do you all know Feruza Balk from best? Return to Oz. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that and uh, uh, the water boy. The water boy of Vicky <laughs> Valencourt. Uh, uh, Return to Oz is mine. She also starred in a Halloween special I really need to cover soon called The Worst Witch from around this time, maybe a few years after this. Do you all know that one? I know I saw it. I can't recall anything about it right now, but I, for some reason, I think my sister recorded it and would play it quite a bit. Scott, what was she in The Water Boy? Uh, his girlfriend. Vicky really? Valancourt. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, now <laughs> I got to go out back and watch that. That was a couple of years after what I think is probably what she's best known for now as an adult, the craft. Mm-hmm. All I know is I wanted to give her mental shocks and send her to Oz after this. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's Beth and Charlie Bradley. We cut to dinner at their house or maybe lunch. I'm not sure. They're still in their church clothes. Did anyone else notice how many times they ate? <laughs> this, they, they had like yeah. four or five meals in this. I, you know, I was not going hungry. I was full by the time the show was over. <laughs> But here's where we meet their parents. Their dad, Bob, is played by Jackson Davies. Did you have to say it right out loud in front of everybody? Why not, Dad? It's the best thing about Sunday school. Well, there aren't any humans there. Ever. It's not a very Christian sentiment. He's a Canadian actor. Wikipedia tells me he is best known for a show called The Beachcombers. He played a Mountie named Constable John Constable. But their mother, Grace, is played by Loretta Swit from M.A.S.H. It's a very practical one. Charlie was black and blue all last year because he had to sit next to Leroy Herdman in school. Woo, yes. Old hot lips herself. And it was hard to shake seeing her as hot lips, I have to tell you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, see, and that that's why I knew for a fact. When I heard, I had forgotten about it over the years, but then I knew for a fact that we watched it because it Mash had just ended. We yeah. absolutely would have been sitting there watching uh, uh, Major Houlihan in the uh, uh, best Christmas pageant ever. Mm-hmm. And when I finally found a copy, uh, you know, I was I remembered as as we went. But you thought it was an episode of After Mash, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I prefer it to an episode of After Mash. <laughs> Actually, if you watched this the night it premiered and then changed the channel to CBS, you could watch Aftermath. <laughs> don't think she was on that episode, though, or any episode. Was she ever on Aftermath? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so. No, but she was smart enough not to. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Dad is not too happy about Charlie's comment about these herdmans. He says it's not a very Christian sentiment to bring up at Sunday school. However, Mom admits she understands where Charlie's coming from, recalling him get beat up at lunch by Leroy Herdman. We find out from Beth there are six Herdman children, and they're all the worst kids in the history of the world. <laughs> they lie, steal, smoke cigars, even the girls. Even the girls. They even blew up some old broken-down tool house, which we get to see. They show us a clip of the Herbin boys playing with the chemistry set, and then they run out before it explodes. And it's an impressive explosion for a TV special of this scale. That, I would say, that's probably the most impressive thing I saw on the show. Yeah. <laughs> so let's meet the Herdmans. We have the aforementioned Leroy. He stole my dessert again. How do you know? Because it isn't here. What was it? Two brownies. That's right. He's played by Jason Micus, who is now a voice actor. He was the voice of Bucky O'Hare. And I used to watch this show. It's an early 90s show about video games. It was called Video Power. Oh. It was hosted by a guy who called himself Johnny Arcade, and it had an animated segment where Jason Micus voiced the animated version of this Johnny Arcade. Rare occasion where I get to talk about video power on the Christmas podcast, but I will take it. Loved that show. What, what was it on? I think it was syndicated. It was uh, okay. I, I grew up near Philadelphia, so it was on Philly 57, they called it. Uh, and that became a UPN station eventually. Yeah, I don't I've never I don't rec recognize the name video power. Started in 1990 and I was 10 in 1990, so. 
Anyway, we have Ollie Herdman, played by Shane Punt. They go back and get hurt. Kick that, Kick that. He only has two other credits on IMDb, a 1985 remake of A Letter to Three Wives and a 1986 movie called The Clan of the Cave Bear, starring Daryl Hannah. <laughs> we have Gladys, the youngest Herdman. The child welfare is at our house every five minutes. She is played by Terry Dean. This is her only acting credit, but she apparently now works for NBC as Senior Vice President of Casting. Little Gladys. And keep shouting, hey, hey! <laughs> <laughs> We have Claude Herdman, played by Bo Heaton. He was also on The Beachcombers. What was watered up close? What? You read about it. They wrapped him up and watered up close. We have Ralph, whom I believe is the oldest. He's played by Glenn Reed. This is his only credit. To be taxed with Mary, his wife, being great with child. What's that? It means pregnant. She was pregnant. And finally, Imogene, the older sister. What's the pageant? It's a play. Like on TV? What's it about? It's about Jesus. Everything here is. Played by Megan Hunt. Her filmography's interesting. She did this in 1983. There was one episode a few years earlier of NBC Children's Theater, and then nothing until the year 2000, where she was in a direct-to-video slasher movie called Lover's Lane. Wow. And then another break... And then something in 2009 called The Tweakers about a <laughs> drug dealer who hires three inept meth heads to kill his lover's husband. I'm assuming she's the lover, but <laughs> IMDb is the only website I could find that documents that this existed and that Megan Hunt was in it. So who knows? Was she Emma Jean Herdman in the, in the, the Tweakers? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. So that I hope not, but. <laughs> That's the Herdmans. We'll get back to them a little later. For now, we see a sign go up at church about tryouts about the Christmas pageant coming up. And Charlie tells his mom he doesn't want to be in it this year. She gives him a big old guilt trip. Says, think about how I would feel sitting there on Christmas Eve with my own kids, not in the pageant. Think of how your father would feel. And dad's not paying attention. <laughs> He looks yeah. relieved. I was going to say, yeah. Dad's thinking about how he'd feel not having to go yeah. to the Christmas yeah. pageant. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> Later, he's like, do I have to go? Yeah. <laughs> but the next thing we see is an ambulance outside Helen Armstrong's house. It turns out she fell down her stairs and broke her leg after getting tangled up in her long phone cord. Okay, so kids, the phone used to have a cord. <laughs> You guys grew up in a phone with a wall with a big, long cord that stretched to at least one other room, right? Yes, I definitely oh, did. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I did. It made the, the main phone always had the longest cord. Yeah. What I was impressed, and this was a testament to the Canadian healthcare system, that she breaks her leg and ends up in the hospital for days. I'm like, wow, that's right, great. Yeah. You know, you get <laughs> like, you know, what? you know, they put you up, you know, keep you in the hospital. Probably insists on it. <laughs> Our our phone cord didn't reach quite to our stairs, though. At least I don't remember anyone trying. But Grace witnesses this as Helen is taken out on a stretcher with curls still in her hair, barking orders at the EMTs carrying her out. And then she sees Grace and gives her a list of things to do for her while she's at the hospital. Like, hold on, lady. Oh, Grace, is that you? Yes. Would you call Edna McCarthy and tell her about the bazaar and the potluck? Don't worry about that And tell George to use up the ham. She's known for that being the directing the the Christmas pageant. Yeah. And we cut to a bunch of other church moms on the phone. She's known for doing a lot of other stuff at, at church. So they're trying to divvy up her church responsibilities. One agrees to take over Sunday school. Another says she'll do a potluck. But all of them have one excuse or another to not have to do the pageant. And all of them ask the same question. How about Grace? How about Grace? How about Grace? How about Grace? Hey, what did you think of that technique of them showing them all talking on the phone like that? Oh, like the crisscross wipe? Yes. It's like, yeah, that was cool. <laughs> like it's a it's a four box, but it's in the shape of an X. So you have like little triangles. That was neat. But now we cut to Grace hanging up the phone, telling her husband, I have to direct a Christmas pageant. Mm, you have my sympathy. Is that all? 
No, you can also have my bathrobe for a shepherd. And? No, that's it, Grace. Well, that's it. <laughs> no help. It. Dad's a jokester. Yeah, he's underrated in this. He's got some good lines. Yes. Well, now we cut to Grace on the phone with Helen, who goes over everything she needs to know about putting on the Christmas pageant. And it is an entirely one-sided conversation. And it goes on forever. <laughs> it does. Well, to the point where she like has to fake someone being at the door just to hang up for her. But before she does, she tells her that that one particular girl, Alice Wendell, can always plays Mary. But it's Grace's responsibility to make the rest of the kids feel important, too. She always tells them there are no small parts, only small actors. I'm sure you've gone on and used that since watching this. I repeat it once or twice a day. <laughs> you know, my kids are in theater, but yeah. they've probably heard that. Yeah. But I'm glad someone invented email. Yeah. <laughs> could have typed all this out and Grace could have just replied back. Perfect. Thanks. Done. Thank you. <laughs> but now we're in school in Charlie's gym class where they're playing basketball, except for Leroy Herdman, who is sitting on a bench, not dressed for gym helping himself to kids' lunches. This is an interesting scene. I don't remember, like, having our lunches, like, lined up along the wall in gym class. No. <laughs> it's not. It's like you finish gym and then, what, you eat your lunch? Is that the deal? We usually had lunch first, then we do yeah, gym. Yeah. But Now, what I am struck by with the Herdmans is they, you know, everyone else seems like they're in the 1980s, but they look like like street urchins from like the 40s. You know, I expected them to have those like news, news, <laughs> the news on or something. Yeah. <laughs> they kind of do. They do have like modern clothes, but it's all like <laughs> this is what we could find at a thrift store and it's all mismatched and it's it's an effective look still. See, and it, it, it wasn't too much of a stretch for me just because we had a couple kids like that in my school. OK. Most days they they had the the grimy uniforms on, yeah, but when it was yeah. out of uniform, the, at a uniform day they had the you know the grimy uh, thrift store clothes on. Right. Okay. Not quite the forties look, but you know, <laughs> six sixties and seventies at least. Sixties. Yeah. All right. Getting with the times. But Charlie tries to stand up to Leroy, but too late. He already ate his dessert. And here Charlie makes the decision to try some kind of weird reverse psychology on Leroy. He says, oh, you can have my dessert tomorrow, too. I get all the dessert I want in church. Thinking Leroy would never attempt to go there, but oh, that's exactly what he does. And all six Herdmans show up at church, <laughs> all lined up in a pew looking bored. For the free food. <laughs> For the free food, right. Yeah, they're <laughs> expecting all this dessert. They do get a collection plate, though. It comes around their way. They don't know what it is, so they just start taking money out of it. <laughs> when I was growing up, they didn't pass around a collection plate. They had baskets on big, long handles that someone would reach down the row for people to drop in their offerings. And I wonder if it's because if this ever happened, I imagine they could just yoink. Nice try, kid. You know, it's funny. It's when I was a kid, they had the opposite. They had the long baskets with on the poles. But then yeah. later on, as I got older, they went to the passing along the baskets. Oh, they so did go. It was the baskets. opposite of what you had. Yeah, they at our old parish, they did that. They switched to the baskets, and yeah. that lasted about two months. <laughs> 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 way, way too big of a drop in uh, donations. Yeah, where we go now, they just have boxes, and you can just drop in your stuff. Oh, really? We have the, still the baskets. They pass okay. along. Everybody passes it along. Mm-hmm. Anyway, the minister, Reverend Hopkins, as his name announces rehearsals for the pageant, starts next week. Reverend Hopkins is played by Anthony Holland. We'll be starting rehearsals soon for our annual children's Christmas pageant. And next week, after Sunday school, we'll decide who will play the main role. IMDb says he's best known for the movie McCabe and Mrs. Miller as the character Hollander. But I spent this whole rewatch thinking... This guy sounds familiar. I bet he's a voice in something. And I looked him up. And the thing I recognized his voice from is another cartoon based on a video game that I used to watch. This one was called Captain N, the Game Master, where he was the voice of Dr. Light, the creator of Mega Man. Wow. <laughs> was it covered on video <laughs> power? No, it was not. They didn't cross. <laughs> like Captain N was more capital N Nintendo and... uh 
the video power, the cartoon that was with that was all characters based on um, games made by one particular company called Acclaim. Actually, in the cart in this cartoon, they called him Doctor Wright, not Doctor Light, because well, bad translation from Japanese. <laughs> Scott does a whole podcast about Japanese Christmas music. How often do you run into stuff like that? Uh, constantly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 j- just the other night, we were watching a Christmas Story, and uh, I, I pointed out that our, our girls get really upset mm, about the uh, mm-hmm. the scene at the end, and I'm like, yeah. you know, I, I get. Lots of different versions of uh, Zingle Bears with the, uh, the <laughs> Zingle <cover>. Bears. Wow. <laughs> anyway, outside church now, Imogene starts to ask Beth about the pageant, namely, what's a pageant? And Beth explains the Christmas pageant is a play about Jesus. And Imogene quips, yeah, everything here is. <laughs> <laughs> I love Imogene. Oh, she's the best. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But here comes the aforementioned Alice Wendelkin, who pipes up. It's really about Mary. Who's Mary? I am. Well, probably I am. I know the part. You may or may not have had an Alice Wendelkin in your life. I couldn't think of one in mine, but I also wouldn't be surprised if my wife told me, oh, I could. I could. I could think of some. Yeah, my my daughter had one in her class who. Oh, dear. She was the lead role in everything until my daughter got. The uh, um, <laughs> oh. she, she 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 was she was the lead singer at um, I it was some church thing, yeah. And the dirty looks the entire time. Oh, oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> from, from from her and her mom. <laughs> oh goodness! Well, yeah. yeah. Uh, this actor playing Alice has that down pat. <laughs> She's played by Ocean Hellman. And folks who've been listening all season, I swear I did not plan this, but here's another actor from Danger Bay. (laughs) This show, I swear I didn't plan this. It was a Canadian show from the 80s that was also on the Disney Channel about a veterinarian at a marina. Ocean Hellman played his daughter. Scott, you remember an American Christmas Carol and the kid who played Tiny Tim was this doctor's son. Mm hmm. This is just some weird serendipity that Danger Bay has come up. I just picked some stuff I wanted to watch. Mike, is there a is there a Danger Bay Christmas episode? Maybe you got to do that. No, I looked and there's not, and that's the worst part of this. Well, we cut to Grace running tryouts of the pageant. She repeats Mrs. Armstrong's line about how there are no small parts, only small actors, and one kid pipes up asking, what does that mean? And she explains every role is important to the story. Even the littlest angel is just as important as Mary. But Alice chimes in. I don't think anyone is as important as Mary. And right now is when the Herdmans quietly walk in with their dirty faces and mismatched clothes. (laughs) And the other kids start whispering and they all get up out of their chairs and move as far to the opposite wall as they can. And the Herdmans casually sit down in the now empty seats. Imogene, though, she actually pushes one kid out of his seat. <laughs> What's interesting is when they went to church, they sat all the way in the back. But here for the tryouts, they're right in the front row. So clearly they're interested. Yeah, they want to know what this is. So Grace separates the group into shepherds and angels. And anyone who has ever had a kid in a Christmas pageant or been a kid in a Christmas pageant knows the boys are shepherds and the girls are angels. Who's the lobster? Yeah, I don't know. My son was a donkey. <laughs> have you have you ever had kids in a Christmas play? Yes. My my kids got to stand in at the uh the live nativity scene a couple times. Oh wow. With a real camel. A real camel. Oh, wow. That's that was, awesome. That was the highlight. Wow. I've <laughs> I've seen real donkeys and cattle, but I have not seen a real camel. That's impressive. I had uh, my son play Tiny Tim, and then my daughter played Tiny Tim. Hey, all right. Well done. <laughs> my kids were just in the nutcracker. I had uh, my, my oldest was a candy cane, and then my son was a mouse. Oh, wow. How did, did did your oldest like being the candy cane? Yes, it was actually a big part in this. It wasn't the ballet. It was like a straight play of it. So she was one of the guards to the land of sweets. So she actually had a significant part. That's what I'd like to be. I'd be a candy cane. Yeah, it was awesome. it. I mean, she had a <laughs> she had a great little suit. I got a matching candy cane tie that I wore to the show. <laughs> 
Well, now it's time to talk about Mary. Grace explains she should be played by someone quiet and gentle and kind. And Imogene immediately stands up. Hey, I'll be Mary. And Ralph over there, he'll be the Joseph. Grace tries to explain she wants to ask for volunteers first. So she asks, who else wants to play Mary? And no one else raises their hand. Not even Alice, who shyly says she doesn't want to do it this year. Later, Alice tells Beth the reason she didn't volunteer was because Imogene cornered her in the bathroom and said, I'm going to be Mary in this play. And then she has an interesting threat. I'm always Mary in the Christmas pageant. Go ahead, then. And next spring when the pussy wheels come out, I'm going to stick a pussy wheel so far down your ear where nobody can reach it. It'll sprout there and grow and grow and grow. And you'll spend the rest of your life with a pussy wheel bush growing out of your ear. What a weird specific threat. (laughs) See, when I was a kid, it was a watermelon seed. Yeah, I've heard watermelon seed, actually. Well, and the fear was that it it would somehow accidentally get in your ear. And the next thing you know, you'd have watermelons growing out your ears. (laughs) (laughs) Or like even swallowing one of it's just like watermelon's going to grow in your stomach. I think maybe if she was, if she thought of something so descriptive, Alice would, would, would believe her. You know what I mean? I mean, it'd freak me out. Like, you can be Mary. Yeah. <laughs> and she's not the only Herdman to volunteer. Leroy, Claude, and Ollie call dibs on being wise men, or as Leroy explains to his younger brothers, It's an old Garth appearing. I'll be a wise man. Me too. And Gladys volunteers to be the angel of the Lord who appears to the shepherds. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> So now it looks like no one else wants to compete for any of these roles, but all the other boys' hands shoot up with just random other questions. One forgot he couldn't be in the pageant at all because his family's going to Philadelphia. Well, why are you even at the tryouts, kid? Like, it's one thing to forget and be like, oh, yeah, I can't do it. But it's another thing for your parents to drop off your kid and have him be at the tryouts. Don't you think that was just a cover? Like, once the Herdmans were going to be in the, in the uh, play, they're yeah. all given excuses to get out. Oh, I got I got to go to Philadelphia. Yeah. 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 I couldn't do that. It was too close to where I grew up. So it was just like, <laughs> nah, you can drive back in time. Until you said where you were from, I was going to say, come on, who would want to go to Philadelphia for Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, The others give equally lame excuses I didn't bother to write down, but that seems to settle it. And Alice tells Beth it's all her mother's fault for not telling the Herdmans no, but how could she? Yeah, it's a church play. It's it's a a church play. (laughs) But the next thing we see is that four-way split screen of all the church moms gossiping about how could Grace do this? It's sacrilegious. And then to Helen Armstrong in the hospital barking on the phone. Who let them in? Where was Reverend Hopkins, I'd like to know. I feel so responsible. And of course, like all gossip tends to do, word gets back to Grace on all the jibber-jabber, and she vows to her husband, I'm going to make this the best Christmas pageant ever. That's one. What a great title of the book. (laughs) Yeah. 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 And she's going to do it with the Herdmans. We'll return after these messages. This year, I'm not putting Duracell batteries under the trees. <laughs> oh, no! But they play more tapes. Give you more flashes. My mind's made up. <laughs> but the toys. Duracell keeps them going up to six times longer than regular carbon batteries. They have to go under the tree. Nope. This year, I'm putting Duracell in the stocking. <laughs> Enter Duracell's $100,000 sweepstakes at your local store. Hi, I'm Bob. And I'm Mark. And we We are the Festive Foreign Foreign Film Film Fans. Fans. Try saying that three times fast. I know. We read your minds. Among all those angry hosts and shows with people doing bad things to each other. Plus the many Tis the Cozy Total Christmas in the 80s podcast you were thinking. You know, the world needs another Christmas podcast. And why not? All those murderers, they get so many popular shows. But what about Christmas? It never killed anyone. 
So join us on the 6th and the 25th of each month as we explore our shared humanity and the movies and music of different countries through a common holiday that we all share. And we may offer some relationship advice or even solve a crime or two. Wow! Festive foreign film fans. Let's see how rehearsal number one goes, and we go back to the church. The first thing we see is little Gladys, who's discovered a closet full of sacramental grape juice. We also see Alice around the corner, just following each Herdman kid around, taking notes about all their wrongdoings on a little notepad. Gonna snitch about them all. But at the rehearsal, the Herdmans keep interrupting with questions, and they're good questions because they've never heard the story of Christmas before. They are good questions. You know, I was thinking, if this wasn't made for TV, do you think that would have been communal wine she would have been drinking? Probably. Oh, yeah. I wonder if that yeah. was, that's what it's supposed to be. But, you know, it's just some churches opt for the juice anyway for, yeah. for similar reasons. But they have good questions. Why are there so many shepherds? What's an inn? Who's Luke? So at Imogene's request, Grace reads the story from the beginning. Not that beginning, but she starts <laughs> in chapter two of Luke's gospel with the senses being ordered. And Mary being great with child, which, as Ralph helpfully explains to his siblings, means she was pregnant. Goes in the book, saying pregnant in church. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she was. I don't think it's a very nice thing to say that Mary was pregnant. But Beth points out, well, she was great with child, it says. So that means she was far along. It's supposed to create a sense of urgency. The whole story is supposed to create a sense of urgency. See, I'm learning something, too. I did not know that. That, that, <laughs> that was great with child men. It was urgent, like it was ready, ready to go. Any pregnant woman is with child. Great with child, to me, reads like she's close to popping. <laughs> but I don't think close to popping is good for church. No, either. that's that's not in the Bible either. <laughs> you're, you're going in Alice's book. <laughs> yeah, I was, yeah, was going to say, that, that's yeah. one of those new modern translations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I could see the four moms talking right now. Close to popping. He said close to popping. <laughs> Drops her dishes. <laughs> but that's later. Next, they ask what a manger is, and Grace starts to explain by saying, well, they didn't have a bed in the barn, and asks the Herdmans what they would do if they didn't have a bed to put a baby. And Imogene recounts, well, we put Gladys in a bureau drawer. <laughs> Not because they didn't have a bed, but because Ollie was still using it and wouldn't give it up. Makes total sense. They're biters, some of these. <laughs> She's also surprised to learn they basically tied Jesus up and put him in a feed box, I believe is her words. And then she asks, where was the child welfare? All of these are great lines, but the best of the bunch, in my opinion, is one of Gladys's shining moments. Grace starts reading about the angel of the Lord appearing to the shepherds watching their flock by night, and Gladys stands up on her chair and shouts, Shazam! <laughs> How did she know Shazam was a Christmas movie? That's what I meant. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Said at Christmas, and when the old is it a Christmas movie debate came up, I liked to point back to this scene with Gladys. <laughs> <laughs> she calls them the Mighty Marvel from Wonder Comics, which is a weird way to avoid copyright because you <laughs> already said Shazam. Yes. <laughs> No, this is the angel of the Lord who comes to the shepherds. Out of nowhere, right? You black knight, right? Well, yes, in a way. Shazam! Anyway, Grace moves on to the wise men now, and the herdmans ask, what kind of present is oil? They compare the wise men to the welfare, but Grace explains no, they were sent by King Herod. And now Leroy asks, you mean he's out to kill the baby and he isn't even in the play? Because they want to play him. <laughs> yeah, now they imagine a gunfight between Herod and Joseph, and it just all erupts into chaos. Grace tries to restore order, but no, too late now. We cut to the Herdmans going over the story together amongst themselves, and one asks what the story is even called, and Gladys, little Gladys, suggests they retitle it Revenge at Bethlehem. <laughs> Which I'm kind of surprised no one has gone to make a revenge at Bethlehem. <laughs> yes. 
I like that title. I was curious. <laughs> I searched for the title, but the results just all came back to this line of this story. So we fast forward now to dress rehearsal, and the first thing we see is Imogene smoking a cigar in the church bathroom. And look, I'm going to level with y'all. I've never smoked, so I don't know if cigars make quite as much smoke as we see in this scene, but it seems like a lot. It does. And there's Alice around the corner again, taking notes of this infraction. Back out in the church proper, the brothers playing the wise men can't even get all the way down the aisle without fighting each other. And that causes the baby angels to start shoving each other, too. (laughs) And not everyone is dressed for dress rehearsal. One angel tells Grace she doesn't have any white sheets and asks if she can wear one with balloons on them instead. (laughs) (laughs) And Grace is very tired now, so she's just, yes, yes, fine. But now I want to see a kid's pageant where all the angels are wearing pattern sheets. <laughs> I like that. I, that was a nice touch. Yeah. I want an angel in Paw Patrol sheets. Make it happen. <laughs> Another shepherd boy tells Charlie he doesn't have a costume. And Charlie explains, well, you're supposed to get your dad's bathrobe. He hasn't got a bathrobe. What is he hanging in the house in? His underwear. <laughs> Do Dad still hang around the house in bathrobes? I never have. <laughs> in the 80s, they did. I guess it's, so. It's an 80s thing. Now all the wise men just are in boxer shorts. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. No. You want to know the last time I wore a bathrobe? 1980-something when I was a shepherd in the Christmas pageant. <laughs> Anyway, Grace gives Imogene a blanket to use in place of baby Jesus until they can get a real baby, and good old Alice chimes in. I thought Eugene Slocum was going to be baby Jesus. Mrs. Slocum changed her mind. Can't imagine why. But then Imogene volunteers to get a baby. (laughs) Says there's always one or two outside the supermarket. I love that. (laughs) Wait a minute, though. What? Who's leaving babies outside the supermarket? You tie a little, they're like bikes. You just lock them to the... <laughs> Put in a quarter. Yeah. See, that, that would have given the, the ending a completely different tone. It, yeah, it would have. <laughs> but here's when Grace says, maybe this year they'll use a doll instead. Well, yeah, Grace, isn't baby Jesus usually a doll in a kid's pageant? Not there. <laughs> they're, they, they, you know, maybe they also have a camel, too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying it's unusual to have a real baby play Jesus, but I've certainly seen more dolls used than actual babies. Imogene adds, this is better anyway. A doll can't bite you. And we cut to Gladys biting Charlie, (laughs) who casually swats her away with a church bulletin, because that's what church bulletins are for. (laughs) If they're not telescopes, they're for swatting. (laughs) So here's where Beth notices Alice writing in her notebook and asks what she's doing. And Alice shows her all of the Herdman's infractions she's writing down to tattle about later when, quote, the whole Christmas pageant turns out to be a mess. No confidence in this one. I don't know. I think it's going to be the best Christmas (laughs) pageant ever. (laughs) Well, we didn't we didn't get that one yet. (laughs) Meanwhile, Grace pleads with Imogene. Mary would never wear earrings. And really, now is way too late for this level of pedantry. Imogene starts ad-libbing here. I got the baby. Don't touch him. I named him Jesus. And then she and Ralph start playing tug of war with the baby doll. (laughs) By the way, did you notice during this whole scene, there's organ music playing in the background? Maybe we'll forget a real baby. Use a doll. That's better anyway. A doll can't bite you. Is there just some organist hanging out playing (laughs) through this whole mess? I didn't notice that, but that's awesome. (laughs) You go back and listen, and it's just like a soundtrack in the background. It's not even music specifically for the pageant, just some stock church organ music. Organist is just bored, so they're hanging out and watching this dumpster fire. (laughs) That's it. They all want to get in and watch. Well, you know, the people in the kitchen, though, that's what they're doing. They're spying on them. (laughs) Yeah, they're all coming out. Yeah. (laughs) 
One of them listens in as Alice decides to show off here when Imogene and Ralph ask whose idea it was to name the baby Jesus. And Alice says, I know what the angel said. She said his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And wrong. Um, actually, that's not what the angel said. That was what the prophet Isaiah said, Alice. <laughs> like hundreds of years earlier. Get it together. Oh, I thought the angel said, just call him Shazam. <laughs> Shazam! <laughs> but either way, that's good Bible quoting. And yeah, one of the church volunteers helping out in the kitchen just kind of stops and admires. And then Imogene replies, he'd never get out of first grade if he had to write all that down. And she <laughs> drops her tray of dishes in shock. I'm like, if that's all it takes to shock you... If you post that on Facebook today, every church mom is going to give it a laughing emoji. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, she made a great point. <laughs> Woman then goes into the back, smells something burning and looks in the oven. Nope, cakes are fine. Follows the smell into the bathroom and finds all the smoke from Imogene's cigar. Didn't even see Imogene, she just sees the smoke. But then we cut to fire trucks pulling up to the church. And I don't know if you noticed, but they're just these generic Hollywood fire trucks that say county on the side <laughs> of them. <laughs> I did not notice that. That's awesome, though. Yeah. <laughs> what I noticed is all the herdmen's climbing all over the fire truck. <laughs> they're climbing on the fire truck. Well, OK. Do you all remember fire prevention week at school growing mm. up? Stop, drop and roll. Yeah, but we'd always have the fire department come to school every year, and a couple of kids would always get chosen from each class to go up in the cherry picker arm. And I never got picked, and I was so bummed every time. And here the Herdmans are just taking it upon themselves. It's just, listen, if you want something done, do it yourself. See, you should have watched this movie then before his fire prevention. Yeah, see, I didn't I didn't <laughs> I didn't watch this until sixth grade. Oh, if I was in fifth grade, still in elementary school, I'd be like, all right, this is my chance. <laughs> you would have made the paper. I yeah, I would have. <laughs> but, but there's a bit of confusion now. These firefighters find the source of the smoke in the kitchen, and it is the cakes that burnt. So I'm not sure what's going on. I think when all the people ran out. All the ladies, they just burned, too. Yeah, all the, I mean, the firefighters go in and try to tell everybody to calmly leave. But you, there are these kids. It's a group of kids. They hear the word fire and they all scream. But why show them looking into the oven earlier? That just made it confusing to me. Have them smell smoke. Look in the bathroom first. But that, of course, leads to another four-way split screen with all the moms gabbing over each other on the phone. Followed by Grace being called into Reverend Hopkins' office, where he says he's been on the phone all day. People think the herdmen set fire to the ladies' room. Others think they set fire to the kitchen. Vera Wendleton, who's Alice's mother, says they all talk about sex and underwear. Well, she's just getting Alice's story, so. The Reverend continues, I don't know, Jesus said, let the children come unto me, but I'm not sure he met the Herdmans, and tells Grace it might be best to cancel the pageant. Oh. But a defiant Grace says, I bet that was Helen Armstrong's idea. And the Reverend says, well, we could blame it on the fire. But as Grace points out, there wasn't a fire. The committee let its precious applesauce cake burn. Tells the Reverend, well, I didn't ask to run the pageant, but I got stuck with it. And I certainly didn't handpick the Herdmans, but nobody else raised their hands. And I don't think we should cancel it. I think it's going to be the best Christmas pageant ever. That's two. <laughs> How did they ever think of that? I don't know. <laughs> but we cut to the Herdman's place now, where a woman from welfare is dropping off a giant gift basket with a wrapped cured ham and other goodies. She just leaves it on the doorstep, shouts Merry Christmas, and pieces out of there as quickly as she can. I don't remember if that scene was in the book. It was not in the version that I saw on stage. I think it, there. I know the uh, the welfare woman is in the book. Is she? Okay. And she does bring the, pa the basket because that's where they get the ham. Right. That sort of just explained away after the fact in the play but let's 
go to Christmas Eve now. It's pageant night. Grace walks into the currently empty church, looks around, tells her husband she, like Reverend Hopkins, is afraid no one's going to come to see it. But her husband reassures her, at least it won't be empty. Look at me. Classic dad. <laughs> when he should have said it. It's like, you know, a traffic accident. People are going to come <laughs> the rubber neck on this thing. They want to see it. <laughs> it would have fit. It would have worked. But kids run in and make a last minute plea. Mom, do we have to be in this pageant? Beth says it's going to be awful. Mary and Joseph are down there looking like refugees or something. And dad finally chimes in with something useful. Well, that's what they were. They were refugees. They were a long way from home, didn't have any place to stay, didn't know anybody. They were probably cold, hungry, and tired, and messy. Well, and that's where I thought they could have done a little more the parallels kind of with the Herdmans in the story. But they did. the dad does reference it, which I like. Yeah. And people do show up for the pageant. Not only does every kid's parent have to be there, but knowing what we do about this particular congregation, none of them would want to miss watching this become a train wreck either. <laughs> and already things are looking bad. Backstage, one of the wise men is missing. Ollie and Claude said Leroy went home, and we follow Leroy, who's walking down the street talking to himself. Here's a present for you, kid. Merry Christmas. Oh, boy. Frankincense. Dumb, dumb, dumb. <laughs> So we don't know if he's going to be back, but it's time for the kids to go out and take their places, starting with the choir, which includes Beth, Alex, and all the other kids who didn't want to play a part next to the Herdmans. The Reverend's greeting people at the door, including Mrs. Herdman. Good evening, Mrs. Herdman. Dressed as nicely as she could come up with, I'm glad she got off for Christmas Eve to see her kids, because I know sometimes you have to work on Christmas. Although I was when I was looking at her, I'm like, is her face dirty, too? <laughs> it was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Showing up for her kids. Unfortunately, I don't have a credit for Mrs. Herdman. She's not listed on IMDb or anywhere. Wow. Sorry, lady. She only says the one thing. She only says her name. And then, like, you kind of see her watching silently. Her eyes are kind of glazed over, but watching for her kids. <laughs> But now we cut to Imogene and Gladys backstage. Gladys wants to improvise her lines, tells the shepherds, it's Jesus and where he is. But Grace begs her, no, just say unto you a child is born. And that's all you tell them. And Imogene is swinging the doll by one foot. Imogene, try to remember that this is a baby. And for tonight anyway, it's the baby Jesus. I don't know if you noticed, but the baby doll is a small, dark-skinned baby girl doll in the dress. I kind of love that detail about this doll. No, I did notice that. I didn't <laughs> That's notice that. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think they did that on purpose, and I'm not sure enough people noticed, but thought it was neat. Yeah. So Imogene sits in front of a mirror in the back, considers Grace's words, looks up at a pinned drawing of Mary holding baby Jesus. It looks like it's from out of a picture Bible. And she just stares at it for a while, silently, takes the earrings out of her ears, takes the dress off the baby, swaddles it, and starts to rock it. Just as Beth comes running in, calling for her, she stops and stares at the sight of Imogene holding this baby doll in her arms. The perfect picture of a Christmas pageant Mary. See, I felt like in some ways... It's it was more cartoonish during the movie, but when they get to this scene, I actually think it's kind of poignant. It's it really actually made an impact on me. Yeah, this mm -hmm. is where I thought uh, Imogene did a great job because she really looks like she's changing while she's looking, staring at that picture and holding the baby doll. Yeah, this is sort of a turning point. This is our first sign that everything's going to be fine. And I love that they just linger on it for a bit, too. Yep. So the pageant begins with the choir singing O Little Town of Bethlehem, followed by Away in a Manger as Ralph and Imogene enter and take their places. Imogene's holding the doll like a proper baby now. She actually burps it, you know, like you do with a real baby. Yeah, yeah. That's what she's familiar with. And Alice is in the choir whispering to Beth, I don't think it's right to burp Jesus as if he had colic. I'm surprised she knew what colic was. <laughs> 
I'm saying, like, as it goes on, we're we're starting to dislike Alice more and more. <laughs> <laughs> well, now even Beth just shushes her because they're supposed to be singing. Why are these two the only ones in choir not singing? <laughs> you ever been in a church choir? <laughs> you know, I have. <laughs> also, he's a baby. That's the whole point. Jesus is billed as the savior of the world, and he was born into it the normal, boring human way as a baby who needs to be burped. And that's kind of the whole point of this. Yes. And that tells me something about Mrs. Herdman. She may not know how to handle six chaotic children, but she at least could handle the basics of taking care of a baby. Well, so far, so good. And next, it's time for the shepherds who make their way down the aisle in their plaid bathrobes. Oh, and wait, is Ralph? He's the Joseph. Ralph right? is Joseph. Yeah, and he's like standing there, like as a protector. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of. He's good got too. his arms crossed. Yes. I like that. <laughs> yeah, I'm in charge. I'm going to protect this baby. <laughs> Watch your step. Yeah. But the shepherds are coming down the aisle in plaid bathrobes. We're really going to get on Imogene about wearing earrings and not first century shepherds in plaid. You're about <laughs> to get some baby angels out here. The one who said she only has balloon sheets has balloon sheets. They didn't really linger on that, but I noticed. Good for you. I did not. That's great. <laughs> but another little girl in the choir who's narrating says her next line, Lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and no Gladys. Grace peeks backstage looking for her, and the narrator continues, pauses again, and then just begins to move on and start to say Gladys's lines for her. When the angel of the Lord appeared to them and said, Fear not. <sighs> And here she comes. <laughs> Barreling down the aisle. Yeah. This this is probably the most iconic scene of this whole thing. I think it's on the cover of the book. <laughs> Gladys comes running out, shouting, Hey, I see you, a child is born. It's Jesus, and he's in the barn. Go on, go on up. Go on, go on up. And it's Jesus, and he's in the barn. Go on, go on. She kind of softly shoves the shepherds on stage. I don't know if I'd describe it as softly. She kind of pushes up. <laughs> Not knocking them over, but... Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, this scene is adorable, and everyone in the congregation is on board now. They all get a kick out of this. And we see close-ups of a bunch of adults just chuckling to themselves and watching. Even the reverend in the back stands and smiled. This is great. Best part. Here's where the rest of the baby angels make their way out, so including the one girl with the balloon sheets. Next come the wise men, and Bob is in the back, looks around to see any sign of Leroy, because he's still not there. And the choir begins singing We Three Kings, so he just sends out the two kings by themselves. And up go Ollie and Claude, as everyone just kind of watches and waits. We see the shepherds look around at each other. We see Alice shake her head. And they get about halfway down the aisle carrying their gold and their myrrh before Leroy finally comes running in behind them carrying not frankincense, but the big wrapped ham from the welfare basket left on his doorstep. It's got a pineapple slice on top and everything. That's another iconic shot from this. Yeah. And a better, he feels a more appropriate gift for a baby. Yeah, I yeah. <laughs> I believe they added the scene of the welfare woman stopping by and dropping off the gift basket just for the movie. I'm not sure, but I think that just helps establish where did he get this ham instead of having to explain it afterward. <laughs> they do explain it afterward anyway, but. First, the pageant wraps up as the narrator continues that Mary kept all of these things and pondered them in her heart. And we see a close-up of Imogene gently holding her baby doll, begins crying as everyone else in the church sings Silent Night. Then the woman who dropped the dishes earlier takes out a tissue to wipe her own tears. Even Alice is seen with a tear trickling down her cheek. And we cut to everyone leaving, talking to each other, and the woman from the kitchen admits, It was the best one we've ever had. That's three. <laughs> Just in case we, we missed that point. We get a say the title of the thing hat trick. 
(laughs) (laughs) They talk about how the angel of the Lord had quite a lot of spirit. Sometimes you can't even hear her in years past. And Mrs. Slocum is there admitting she should have let them have her baby play Jesus. Some other mom asked, who was baby Jesus? They didn't even know it was a doll. See, it doesn't matter. Right. But we go to Beth to recap very close to the camera, just staring into our souls because it's Feruza Balk. It did seem real, as if it might have happened just that way. I told Imogen the play was about Jesus, but that's only part of it. It was about a new baby, and its mother and father were in a whole lot of trouble. No money, no place to go, no doctor. We're then told by Charlie that the Herdmans didn't even stay for the customary party after the pageant. I don't remember there being a party after the Christmas Eve pageant. Yeah, you'd think people would have other things they need to attend to, but... (laughs) Right, like Christmas Eve. (laughs) When I was in church choir, we partied quite a bit after Midnight Mass. (laughs) Did you? Well, because you did mid... (laughs) That's because you're a Midnight Mass. Look, we're up already. I, I, you know, I haven't been to Midnight Mass too often. Only only a couple times in my life. It's at 1030 now. Is that because no, you? Is that, that, <laughs> did you know where the they kept the grape juice? Is that why you? <laughs> <laughs> we, we we went back to someone's house for a little more than grape juice. <laughs> well, all right. Uh, but Charlie says I don't think they took anything, but we do see that Imogene took something. Took the drawing of Mary holding baby Jesus, that really spoke to her soul. So she just yoink. So Grace is cleaning up. And her husband asks what to do about the ham. Where did Leroy get it? Here's where she explains someone named Hazel Phillips, which is the most church mom name I have ever heard, (laughs) told her it was in the Herdman's welfare basket and they wouldn't take it back because Leroy insisted you don't take back a present. Well, you don't. But Grace said she didn't argue because she thinks it's the first thing they ever gave away in their lives. And then the whole Bradley family stops as the church bells start to play. Listen. It's 11.55. It's almost Christmas. Grace says she wishes Mrs. Herdman had been there to see them. Did no one tell her she was there? (laughs) Like, not even the reverend? That's rude. I think as she's working always two shifts, no one knows who she is. Well, but the reverend, like, said, she said, she introduced herself. She's like, oh, good evening, Mrs. Herdman. Like, he didn't even tell Grace that she was there. That's, I don't know. He's busy. It's Christmas Eve. Yeah. And yeah, maybe she did have to go back to work, because the last thing we see are the Herdman kids running around downtown by themselves. Just having fun five minutes before Christmas. They run past a beautifully lit tree with the warm colored lights that you don't even see anymore unless they're specially made. And Gladys, still in her halo and holding the star-shaped wand, stands in front of the tree, looks up into the sky, and shouts one last time to send us home. Hey! Hey! I think your child is good! And that's it. Any final thoughts on the best Christmas pageant ever? Well, they didn't explain why Beth was wearing a beret earlier in the movie. I wondered that. She had a beret on. It was the style (laughs) at the time. But I I did at the end. You know, you have to wipe away a tear when she's like, hey, unto you a child is born. (laughs) Yeah. I I will say, I'm glad she didn't write like uh, any of the Star Wars movies here in Harrison Ford say, (laughs) "The, the Empire truly did strike back. Does she do that in the best Halloween ever, too? I don't know that I've seen that in the last almost 40 years. Yeah, well, that one's kind of newer. It's, uh, she actually wrote two sequels to this. I'm assuming they both have the Herdman children in them. But uh, one was called The Best School Year Ever, and that was published in 1994. And The Best Halloween Ever is even newer in 2004. Oh, I don't remember in the book if they were kept repeating the best Christmas pageant. I don't know if she thought it needed to be in the the movie just to emphasize because you don't see the book. I don't know. They did it in the play. Oh, they did. 
<laughs> yeah, and it was fine. Like I chuckled only because I had also watched this for so many years, so I knew it's there. And I always like made a point, just like they said the thing. <laughs> Did the, the old DiCaprio point. Did you have to take a drink at that point? Actually, I did have water, so I might have. <laughs> but this is such a sweet story, and I kind of forgot about it for a few years. But I'm glad I rewatched it this year, and I'm glad I got to show it to my family, both this TV special and on the stage. My wife had not heard of it before, so I was excited. And I think it holds up so well. Yeah, my, my, my kids like it, and they're the older ones are much older they're uh kind of jaded about a lot a lot of these things now but oh dear I, I you know i read i read the book to all four of them multiple times um so it, it's one they i mean they they still enjoy the movie and i really still find that scene where emma jean's sitting there and staring up at the it's very touching i don't mm-hmm. that is i find it meaningful oh yeah yeah they they hold on that for a while yeah. and it, it's best done here but yeah, that's why it's still popular to put on every year. I don't know how often it's shown on TV, but while you're streaming Christmas specials this year, look this one up. Share it with someone. It's a good time. Is it shown much on TV? I don't you don't find it very much at all. I haven't seen it on TV in a very long time, but I have a feeling like it's probably on one of those like me TVs or one of those like cable channels. I don't I don't have cable, but that feels like it would be a good fit for one of those. Did you, there's another, there's a story like this that's similar, and I can't remember what the show, it's where they give, there's a family where they, they have this, uh, where they hand out uh, Christmas cakes, and they deliver them to the homes, and they deliver a cake to this home, and it's, it's like a Herdman family, and then they learn to do good things. I forget what that movie's called, but it's very similar. Yeah, I don't know. One. Okay. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that, but. If you know what Bob's talking about, tell us. But thank you both for participating in this podcast pageantry with me. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, this has been fun. And if people want to swap your frankincense with a whole cured ham, where can they find you on the Internet? Scott. Uh, I, I'm the host of the uh, Holly Jolly X Masu podcast. Um, I cover Japanese Christmas music. You can find me just about anywhere uh, you've stream podcasts and bob yeah i'm on the i'm a co-host uh with uh mark we're on the festive foreign film fans podcast where we watch foreign christmas movies from a different country every episode and we talk about the the customs of the country some of the music and and in fact i could put on my festive foreign film fans hat and say there is a country i think it's denmark where they they do park the kids outside do they Yes, they the the parents will go in and like a coffee shop or whatever, and they have the kids out because they believe the fresh air is good for the kids. And you'll see a picture of like 150 baby buggies all lined up. <laughs> wow! Yeah. Now they're I think they're within. They could see them. But, well, you know, sure. They're not shopping, but <laughs> they're grocery shopping. <laughs> I'll be right back. Excellent. Uh, Well, you can find and should find all of those links in the show notes or at adventcalendar.house. There you'll also find a link to follow me wherever I wish to be found. Thanks for listening. And if you thought this show was full of chaos, my next episode's got Muppets. (laughs) Haven't run out of Muppet stuff yet, so join me in a couple of days. Till then, for Bob and Scott, from the world premiere of Revenge at Bethlehem. This is Mike Westfall saying Shazam! And hey, be careful of that icy patch. Good night, y'all. Good night. Next time on the Advent Calendar House. Tell me if my plan is going to work. You're planning to kidnap Santa Claus? What else? Will the plan to kidnap Santa Claus succeed? By the prophecy of the genie, and from the powers of destiny, I bring you a word. Oh, what's the word? Maybe. <laughs>